Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have David Schneider. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and he wrote the book, The Invention of Surgery, A History of Modern Medicine from the Renaissance to the Implant Revolution. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. So we'll get into your book in a little bit. But first off, tell me your story and your journey to where you are today. Well, so as an orthopedic surgeon, I've been in practice for 18 years. And it was about eight years ago, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm interfacing so much with patients. And it's obvious they don't understand this arc of how we got to now. They just assume that uh, any kind of surgical problem can just magically be treated. And it must have been this way for hundreds of years. Joint replacements must have been around forever. And if I have an infection, it just give me a couple few magic doses and I'll be great. And I realized there was this huge just blind spot that patients have. So I started writing the book and little did I know, I realized I was going to learn a massive amount myself. Much of it was so hard to discover. And of course, halfway in, I realized what I'm really writing about is a revolution that no one has named. That's why I coined the phrase, the implant revolution, that this magic thing happened in about a decade's time period that you had simultaneous inventions of antibiotics, transistors, polymers, and modern metal alloys. So you went from prior to 1941, nothing going in anyone's bodies, not joint replacements, not pacemakers, not cardiac stents, deep brain stimulation, for goodness sakes, wasn't, you know, none of that was going in. And by the time we get to the 1960s, we're able to do all kinds of joint replacements and stents and bypass surgery and it's become so commonplace that we don't even think about it being miraculous anymore. So that was the thrust of my book. Wonderful. And tell me a little bit about your practice and how the pandemic has affected your practice. So I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon. And I would say I do have a nationwide practice in part because I do a lot of the revision, total shoulder replacements and revision, total elbow replacements. You know, last few days I've talked to patients from Florida Virginia, Texas, Nebraska, San Francisco, you know, people who've kind of come to the end of their rope because they don't have mm -hmm. anything left, multiple operations. So in some ways, Kevin, I haven't missed a beat. We did have a few weeks around the launch of my book, the invention of surgery March, uh, launched March 3rd. But so I took a few weeks off for the publicity tour going coast to coast, right. giving grand rounds. I was lucky to give grand rounds at places like the Mayo Clinic and NYU incredible to be able to be to do that but other than those few weeks my telemedicine visits like i think a lot of us just completely morphed and for the first time ever was actually being reimbursed mm -hmm. for all these uh, telephone calls and online stuff i was doing but it it actually in a lot of ways is like we know about revolutions it's changed the game for me to be able to just kind of alter my practice mm -hmm. a little bit and serve a different clientele sure now let's talk about the wonderful excerpt that you submitted on Kevin MD and it was titled surgery is nothing short of a stupendous <laughs> magic act. And it really gave a nice history of the evolution of surgery. So I was wondering if you could walk my audience through that article and why did you choose that specific excerpt to share on Kevin MD? Yeah, you know, my, my book is, uh, I think 384 pages long. So trying to find an excerpt has been challenging and I've had, I've been lucky to have uh, excerpt on wonderful pages like yourself uh, or, and well as popular science and Buzzfeed and things like that. But for you, I chose the excerpt I did because I knew a lot of your followers obviously are physicians, not all. Well, what's the breakdown, Kevin? What do you think the breakdown is of your audience? So I would say it's about 70 to 75% clinicians, and most of those clinicians are, in fact, physicians. Yeah. So I wanted those clinicians to be reminded of the fact, once we got into the 1880s and the antiseptic technique and germ theory had finally taken hold, can you believe it? In the 1860s, still it was only a tiny percentage of clinicians believed that germs were real. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the 1880s that, that enough people believed in Lister and Ted or Bill Roth. You know, you and I can remember back to our medical school days, the Bill Roth one, the Bill Roth mm -hmm. two, those kind of operations, abdominal operations. But that's Ted or Bill Roth. He was in Vienna 
And he was the first guy, and this is half century before antibiotics were discovered. He was doing rectal surgery, esophageal surgery, abdominal surgery. Of course, thoracic surgery was an impossibility. But this guy, a half century before antibiotics, was doing rectal surgery successfully. Mm. I can't believe it. So in the excerpt I submitted for you, it was walking through the 1880s, and the very first time, the miracle of elective surgery was contemplated. So guys like Halstead were able to think, you know what, these people have this like horrible pain and these horrible symptoms associated with umbilical hernias and inguinal hernias. Maybe we can actually volitionally go to the operating room and have the temerity to believe that we're going to leave the operating room with all of us alive. Mm -hmm. That's a miracle. And now elective surgery is so commonplace, we forget the audacity of going to the operating room in the 1880s, 1890s. But that happened. And, you know, at first, when, when Halstead came back from Europe, his first operative theater in New York, this is before he'd gone to found, help found Hopkins, he had an operating room tent that they built there on the grounds of Bellevue. And operating rooms slowly were built. So if you look at what hospital construction was happening in the 1880s, all these big hospital buildings only had one operating room. Mm-hmm. Mayo, Hopkins, even special surgery, all those places had one operating room. And it wasn't until decades later that they thought, you know, business is so good. Let's build a second operating room. And it wasn't until the implant revolution happened that it opened up the doors to say, you know, you go to any major metropolitan center, they're going to have 30, 40, 50 ORs, which would have been mind boggling 100 years ago. Absolutely impossible. So that's what the implant revolution brought us besides cardiac stents and urethral stents and plastic surgery implants. It's been it's been a miracle, really. Now, are there a few things that today's surgeons can learn by looking back at history and seeing the stories and reading about the stories of the surgeons from yesteryear? I, I think one of the big things is is thinking about and one of the, my big home take home points, especially over the last ninety days, is realizing that revolutions always happen with a combination of technological and scientific innovation matched with catastrophe or chaos. Well, that's what we're having right now. And look at us, Kevin. (laughs) We're having this great conversation that other people can think about, but those who think about the way telemedicine is going to work. It went from you and I making phone calls, circling back with our patients, to now realizing I can actually have a fairly intimate conversation with my patient, even Mm -hmm. as an orthopedic surgeon, preoperative, immediately post-operative and years down the road to check in with them. And of course, you know, those who are the most alert will say, well, what about, what about if we enhance our ability and make this connection even more intimate? And is there a way we can actually do physical therapy? What if we have tracking devices? It's actually something I'm working on tracking devices to look at shoulder and elbow range of motion and be really scientifically objective and stop guessing. I think it's going to open this right now. Our pandemic will open doors besides thinking about the way that vaccine development is going to happen. I mean, Kevin, I'm, you know, the virologist in our midst are all thinking about the fact that, you know, it used to take four years at best to come up with Mm -hmm. a vaccine. I think this will revolutionize the way we do the flu vaccine. That'll be a lot less guesswork and a lot more adaptable on the fly. I think there's going to be a lot of things that will happen. But again, scientific revolutions tend to happen because of technological innovations meeting catastrophe. And those, those few among us who are the most alert are going to be the ones that make history. Sure. Your book takes us through a wonderful journey of the history of surgery. Now, what are some ways that surgeons have evolved over the decades? <laughs> Well, one of the first things that had to happen was, of course, was just treating skin and washing our hands. And that's all Joseph Lister, all hail Joseph Lister. He's my favorite surgeon of all time. He's my hero. It's actually the second book I'm working on right now. We're about ready to uh, pitch it to publishers. It's about Joseph Lister and his wife and the the teamwork that they had to truly change history. But surgeons first had to think about prepping the skin and really the first implant it was all suture. Sutures used to be just single strands of horse hair, and then it was silk. 
but that wasn't sterile ever. And Joseph Lister had the intelligence to say, well, we're washing the skin, we're washing our hands, maybe I should prepare the suture. And in my archival research all over the British Isles, I've actually gotten a hold in my hands, in a letter, I'm going through all his letters, I've, I've handled every letter to and from him. And here in this little packet, I pulled it out, here's some of his specially treated suture from 175 years ago. That was kind of a cool moment. But then, you know, they just kept progressing and thinking, how can it be better? It has to be better. And finally, it was Bill Roth who had the courage to say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny everyone ahead of me and say abdominal surgery is possible. You know, in every operating room, or I should say, there are operating rooms in every hospital in America where abdominal surgery is happening today. And that was the, you know, there be dragons. But those surgeons, and you know, if we think about today as a surgeon, think about what the sheer bravery and courage to tackle what everyone said was wrong. Don't do it. Who do you think you are? There have to be clinicians, scientifically with great ethics, say, we're actually going to try this. We're going to cure epilepsy. We're going to cure heart disease. We're going to say that, that brain tumors, the, you know, astrocytomas, they're actually, they actually are treatable. And we're going to tackle this. And we're going to remember that people used to say a glioblastoma was a kiss of death. Not anymore. So it, it'll happen. We're talking to David Schneider. He's an orthopedic surgeon and the author of The Invention of Surgery, A History of Modern Medicine from the Renaissance to the Implant Revolution. David, what is the number one tip today's surgeons can learn from your book? Ooh, the number one tip. I would say the embrace of science. Prior to Lister, really the only scientific surgeon was John Hunter. And instead of just practicing and trying to be this bold surgeon. And John Hunter was that in the 1700s in London. Some of the stuff he did are just kind of outrageous. You can't believe that people actually did that. But it was Joseph Lister, through a very careful scientific research program, said, I'm going to prove I have to first understand how blood clots and then how inflammation happens and then why infection happens. And yes, I'm jumping on board and saying germs are real. I'm one of those crazy people that's going to say germs are real. People just slayed him. And when he got to Glasgow, this was his second major act in his career by the time he was in his 40s. That's where he made world history in Glasgow. He was a Londoner, but he went to Glasgow. And, and they said, you know what? Um, we don't really need people like you. We don't have time for this scientific stuff. We're into treating patients. And Joseph Lister said, well, I'm going to do both. And I would say all of us, even if we're not in full-time academics, we still, as surgeons, have to embrace scientific surgery, follow the literature, go to meetings, listen to the wise among us who want to be involved in scientific research. That's the way to practice surgery. And we can't be like those who criticize Lister for, for being too much into this unproven world of research. And my final question, David, what is your take-home message that you want to share with the Kevin MD audience? That we are part of a revolution and it is nothing short of a miracle. And I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I get to treat, I just walked out of, I'm in clinic today, just walked out of a couple of rooms where people had lost all hope, gunshot wounds, cancer, bone loss, car accidents, that we are in the midst of a revolution. It is miraculous, and we, we probably as hard as it is, and as discouraging as practice can be some days, it, it is like the greatest uh, blessing in the world to be able to treat people so powerfully. And how can people find your book? So uh, it's still on any online thing, including uh, the Big A. Uh, you know, the invention of surgery. Mm. I've been very blessed. The sales have been great. The audiobook is amazing. If people are more into audiobooks, then in rare, the day my book came out was the day of the Audis. The guy who narrated my book won the Audi. It's like the Grammy, the mm -hmm. Oscar for the top narrator in the world. So uh, any, any side and in bookstores, but the audiobook itself is incredible. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight and time, and thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate it.